Welcome, this is uh, Turfgrass Soils class, Hort 166. This is a little bit of a review for some of you, hopefully. Um, if not, it's a little introduction into chemistry. This is by no means a full chemistry course. We have great chemistry instructors here. Pete Golden, my good friend, does a wonderful job with chemistry. But this should get you started into understanding just how really important chemistry is when we study soil and particularly when we start dealing with fertilizers on the golf course and um, actually all the plant protectants for that matter. Anytime we start with chemistry we want to start with the periodic table. Um, you'll notice most of the stuff at the top is things we'll be dealing with. We'll be dealing with carbon which is here uh, which has very unique properties for organic chemistry, nitrogen, in our fertilizers, phosphorus in our fertilizers, potassium fertilizers, then sodium, magnesium. So you see all the things we use in turf grass are going to be on the periodic table. To help you understand the periodic table a little bit better, um, we read from left to right. Um, the columns are the families of elements. Um, I'll show you the noble gases. We will not deal with the noble gases very much in soil because they're stable. They uh, have a complete outer electron shell, so they do not combine to form elements. And most of the things we're going to be interested in combine, either uncombine, recombine, or have to do with pH. Um, group 1 are the alkali metals, some of the micronutrients we'll talk about. Um, group 4 is going to be very important to us. Uh, because they have four electrons in their outer shell which makes them the basis for building organic chemistry and all things organic um, will have carbon and will be from from living stuff so the building blocks of living material be it us as humans grass insects nematodes or uh, diseases all are built from carbon and most of the chemicals we use to control uh, turf pests are also carbon based. So here's the periodic table again. Here's the noble gases. So helium, neon, argon, those are all going to be stable and we won't deal with with those. This group here the, with the carbon and then also uh, hydrogen is going to become very important because um, forming water with H2O and also uh, CH is car built building carbon uh, chemistry uh, blocks. So a step back there's three things that make up each element. There are electrons. Electrons are negative you need to know this for the exam. Protons are positive and neutrons have no charge. The negatively charged electrons have no weight. So inside the nucleus there are protons and there are neutrons and then there's an electron zooming around outside of them making an uh, electrical field. So electrons can be lost or gained depending on how many the element has. So the atomic weight is the total weight of all the electrons, protons, and neutrons, but we can eliminate the electrons because they have almost no weight or little weight or unmeasurable weight and add the protons and the neutrons together to get an atomic weight. And atomic weights will become important when we figure out fertilizer because if, if it's ammonia, NH4, well, ammonia, the N has a certain weight and the H has a certain weight and um, we'll add those together and to figure out how much actual nitrogen will be available to the plant. And we'll show you how to do that as we get further into our fertilizer problems in this program. A molecule is a combination of atoms. So we've got this simple molecule, water, which we're going to talk about quite a bit, uh, a two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2O or, uh, or HOH. Um, is, is a balanced thing. And then this molecule 
which is a simple sugar molecule, C6H12O2. So you see that the same things, same elements of water, just adding carbon, make it a dramatically different thing. And, and one of the functions of life in the photosynthesis equation that I'm going to talk about at the end of this, this figures very highly into that. We also have quartz, uh, silicone dioxide, two oxygens and a silicone, uh, which basically makes up rocks. Um, most of the rocks are not pure quartz. They're not pure silicon dioxide. There is a lot of sand that we talk about, silica sand, that's completely silicone dioxide. But most rocks are a mixture of quartz and other compounds um, that would be called a heterogeneous module, and you can see that in this rock from the different strata and the different elements that were available when the, the rock was formed. So when we look at soil and we see try to see what it's made up of because that becomes very important because we have to figure out what's going to come out of it fifty percent of the soil is made up of oxygen so oxygen is a very important part of that silica would be thirty six percent of most of the soil so most of the sands uh, are made up of just these two elements when we get into smaller sized particles silt, silts are probably mostly silica and oxygen also but when we get into the clays we can have additions of some of the heavier metals some aluminum which uh, five percent not used by the plant but used in the clays uh, iron iron is can be a problem it is a micronutrient and it can become toxic to plants if we have high percents of iron and we'll show you iron reacts with oxygen in ways that you all know you've all seen rusty metal where it becomes oxidized or you've all smelt um, what my children like to call pig mud, which is um, iron that's anaerobic and has been reduced. So uh, potassium, uh, definitely used by the plant, a stress nutrient can be part of the soil. Carbon, mostly from the living things that are in the soil. Salt, lots of salt in the soil. Salt is becoming a big problem, particularly in water. When we use effluent waters, uh, water from waste treatment plants are going to have a lot of salt in it. And also, if you're managing a golf course by the coast, you could have salt in your irrigation water, and that can cause you problems, particularly if you have lots of salt in your soil to boot. And salt will displace many of the other uh, cations, positively charged elements or combination of elements that are necessary for the plant. So calcium, magnesium, um, uh, that's the sodium. That, that should be, get that off of there. That should just be N and then phosphorus is P. So we can see that one of the, the most necessary for plants, nitrogen 0.01% of the soil and phosphorus 0.05, uh, the plant's going to have to come up with ways to get this stuff, and it comes up with lots of things when we talk about the uh, symbiotic relationships of bacteria. You'll see that the, the plants have evolved ways to get more of, of these nutrients. So the most important molecule we're going to talk about is water. Water's a polar molecule, so the, the oxygen the big part of the molecule is going to be negative and the hydrogens are positive and that allows this to be the universal solvent it allows all sorts of reactions to take place in water and it allows water to line up and act as a magnet in a lot of different ways so it's really the basis of soil chemistry is, is water and from that, acids, bases, pH is going to be another factor in determining how 
efficient our soil is going to be or how effective it will be at raising turf grass. So we've got a pH scale and the, the pH is a little bit confusing. We're going to need to take some time on this and think about it. A pH of 7 is when the hydroxyls, the OH minus part of the water, and the hydrogen cations are equal. So there, there's equal amounts. That's a neutral pH. As pH goes down, the acidity goes up. And it goes up. So battery acid would have a pH of 1. That would be one of the most acidic things we could have. A pH of 6 is only a small amount of acid. So we've got milk, um, rain. But going from 6 to 5, it's 10 times more acid than going from 7 to 6. So it's an extra 0. So we're going to show that there's 14 zeros on here. Um, going to 4 would be 100 times um, uh, lemon juice gets to be lemon juice and vinegar are pretty strong acids and then stomach acid even even more than that and then going up the scale it gets more basic so lye you can burn yourself on lye just like you can burn yourself on acid uh, just the the hydroxyls um, seawater is about eight um, human blood is 7.5 so living turf grass we're gonna want a little acid but in this range 6.5 to 7.2 is going to be a range we're shooting for to have optimum availability of all the nutrients for turf grass plants. So water is going to affect this water. The hydrogens can come off the water, the hydrogens can go off the water. This is a good way of thinking about it because it if we have say we have 14 zeros and we have to have some on each side so at, at pH of 10 we can have 10,000 OH ions and 10,000 or 10 million hydrogen ions and 10 million hydroxyl ions at a pH of 14 the most basic we would have 14 zeros on the OH and no zeros on the H going up to the top we would have 14 zeros on the hydrogen, that would be the most acid, battery acid would have, uh, what is that, that's 10 billion uh, hydrogen cations for each 10 hydroxyls. So this is one way of looking at that to show just how dramatic. So each, it's a logarithmic scale. So going from 7 to 6 and then 6 to 5, it's 10 times more to go up each. And that's some, so it's an extra zero. So you probably want to take out your calculator and play with the logarithmic scale and see just how it takes a lot to move pH. It takes a lot more to move pH from 11 to 10 than it does from 10 to 9. 10 times more. One thing that helps us in turf grass are buffers. And what a buffer is, just like buffer and aspirin, it's something that can take hydroxyls or hydrogens out of solution to buffer the pH, to make it more constant. It turns out soil is probably one of the best buffers we have. So if you throw some soil into an, uh, a solution of water that has extra hydrogen floating around in it, extra cations, so the pH would be low, those those hydrogen cations will bind to cation exchange capacity sites in the soil and make that water more basic. So it will it will hold that and that, that's one thing. It takes a lot to change some soils if they have a high cation exchange capacity it should change their pH. Um, and our blood our blood system uses carbonic acid, H two CO three to, to buffer our blood. So uh, buffers are, are important. 
when I did research hydroponically, we had to put buffers in the solution because as turf grass roots take up nitrogen, they also take up hydrogen, which leaves hydroxyls, which makes it basic. So we had to keep adding acid to keep the pH buffer, to keep the pH constant. But we put a, a hydroxyl buffer in there that would allow us not to have to be constantly adjusting the pH. So we could adjust the pH once a day to get it back, to get the buffers back so that they were useful. So it's buffers are like a storage place for um, hydroxyls or hydrogen cations. So that organic part, that blue upper part of the periodic table, all organic compounds have carbon and hydrogen. Most also have oxygen, uh, sulfur, and nitrogen. But all living things, the carbon becomes the most important thing. All the carbon in the soil is from living things. When an animal crawls down in the soil and dies, that becomes part of the soil. When a plant root dies, all that carbon is used by bacteria and things that live in the soil as, as food sources. So there's a, there's a constant carbon cycle going on in the soil, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in the course also. So any cation other than hydrogen, any compound uh, like a salt, like sodium chloride, or all, most all the fertilizers we use in turf grass are salts. So they are going to either make the soil more acid or make the soil more basic. And you need to understand that and then you need to be adding things like lime or adding lime if you're fertilizers are making the soil more acid, which is generally the case here, or fertilizing with something that will make it more acid, like um, ammonium sulfate, which leaves sulfur, which will make the soil more acid. So we can buffer, we can move our soils one way or the other. And as we talk about U USGA greens, one of the things we give up by going to an all sand based screen as we give up cation exchange capacity that gives a buffering control of the soil so older push up style greens with more silt and clay in them are going to be much easier to keep a balanced pH as we go to a more less compaction uh, a sand green we're going to have to be better at chemistry and better at figuring out to change our pH and better at testing pHs and monitoring them throughout the year. So when we add sodium chloride, our typical salt, to water, the water pulls it apart. The hydroxyls, the OH, the negative part of the water, this is a water molecule, those all line up around the sodiums and the positively charged hydrogens all line up around the chloride. So the, the water, the sodium, doesn't take up space. It just goes right in there and takes up air space, be, and the water aligns itself around it. So this is how we get salt water, and that, that's the difference between salt water and fresh water. And those salts, when they get in the soil, can displace elements that the plant needs, and, and those elements will move below where the plant can reach them, and this can cause some problems with nutrients. So the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is oxidation and reduction. And this is going to come into play in soils. As we get deeper into the soil, we have less oxygen. Or as we get further into the summer, when it gets hotter, or if we have water on the top of the soil, it's going to reduce the amount of oxygen. Oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor for many reactions in the soil. So there, there are electrons that have to go somewhere. They go to oxygen forming water, simple, very efficient reaction that takes place all the time. When we take that oxygen away, we 
stop that from happening. So one of the most common instances of oxidation is when we take iron, Fe3 plus is reduced to Fe2 plus. With oxygen present, this happens to metal all the time, and this is where we get a yellow or an orange rust color. When we eliminate the oxygen, the iron will turn gray. It will stay ferric. And then some other microorganisms can use it it to deposit things on and it becomes smelly or they'll be using sulfur as the terminal electron acceptor and that, that's quite smelly also. Facultative, which means they can use either oxygen or non-oxygen. If they were obligate anaerobes, they would have to be anaerobic. But most of the microorganisms in the soil that are anaerobic are facultative because sometimes oxygen will be around. Um, they'll use oxygen or iron for electron deposits um, into the organic matter. So as they do their reactions, as they take up the things that are connected to the hydrogens, they need a place to put that hydrogen. And oftentimes it goes on to oxygen. So I'll give you an example of this. This is a soil profile probably from Africa or somewhere where there's a high amount of iron. Iron containing soils generally tend to be darker colored, tend to be red. Um, this soil you can see there's organic matter deposited in the top layer. That would be most of the carbon is going to be right up there where the plant roots are putting down carbon and where the insects are, are living. Then here we've got an oxygenated level where water moves through it quite rapidly. So most of the iron, most of the nutrients are going to be washed through that what we call the A layer. And the E layer is where things begin to accumulate. So in this soil, iron is beginning to accumulate here. Well, to this level, there's oxygen. So when we have oxygen, we have uh, oxidation going on. We have terminal electron acceptor is oxygen. And we have orange colored oxidized iron. Below that, where we don't have oxygen, we've got ferric iron that's going to be gray in color. So you can see that the level of oxygen affects the soil profile and, and what you'll find. So this is a, a soil that's wet generally a lot of the time, and this, this will be a different smelling soil. In, in mucky. So you would have to take that out and dry it out. And if you dried out that soil, it would turn orange. The next thing we're going to talk about is energy. Uh, if you see this NRG, NRG, that's my shorthand for energy. I apologize for that, but it's the way when I study this stuff to take faster notes. Um, and energy is the capacity to do work. So matter is always trying to go to its lowest possible energy state. Some students are trying to do that. If we can overcome it, we can, uh, we can move forward and, and do well in these classes. So please try to um, overcome your lowest energy state and, and keep moving um, in your work and your studies. Um, energy can change forms. So types of energy we'll deal with in this course, light energy. Very important for photosynthesis. Chemical energy, we can have a reaction. We can have something like sugar. If we put acid in table sugar, we'll get a, a violent reaction that causes smoke and, and carbon to be in and we'll end up with burnt sugar. So that's releasing that energy. And that's what plants do through respiration. Potential energy, um, when we have a golf cart at the top of a hill, and somebody doesn't put on the brake, that potential energy can become real energy as it rolls down the hill. And then kinetic energy is, as the golf cart's moving, it has more energy. It picks up steam as it would. So a moving object can do more work than a stationary object. Energy equals half the mass times the velocity squared. So as the cart gets going faster down the hill, it's harder to stop and get out of the way, and sometimes it ends up in the lake. So... That's uh, one of the things, unfortunately, we see on the golf course more often than we should when somebody forgets to put their 
parking brake on. Energy will move down a gradient. Um, to move it up a gradient takes effort. So a slope, ball moving down the stint meter is a slope. Uh, temperature gradients, if we have put ice out on a hot day, it will rapidly rise to equal the temperature outside. Uh, diffusion of gases and nutrients, if we have an area very high in oxygen in the soil around a drainage pipe, for instance, that oxygen will diffuse into the soil. And weather, we go from high pressure systems to low pressure systems. And high pressure is going to push on low pressure, and that's what makes our weather, and that's what makes wind. So as you start watching the weather channel, you can think of simple gradients. And I know a lot of your bosses are going to be addicted to the weather channel or uh, have their own weather station where they can watch, uh, watch the weather and predict which way rain's coming for irrigation and fertilizer purposes and just for general play it becomes very important to set up maintenance plans to try to be able to predict the upcoming weather so the most important reaction we're going to talk about throughout this semester is photosynthesis photosynthesis is this reaction on the top uh, respiration is the opposite reaction here on the bottom. CO2 from the air plus water from the ground, the plant takes that up. We add light energy and chlorophyll and we get sugar plus oxygen and water. So some things we need, we need oxygen to breathe so the plants create oxygen, they sequester that carbon and produce some water. Now, there's, there's a net loss of water, really, so you could leave that off. And the equation's not as balanced here as it probably could be, but this is an oversimplification. You need to know where all parts of it come from. So CO2 comes from the air. So the plants make sugar not from eating. You can't feed a plant cheeseburgers. The plant has to make its own sugar from sunlight. So if you try to grow a plant in the shade, you're effectively starving it. The plants will look like Auschwitz victims. They'll be thin and tall and spindly and trying to go up to get the light. They don't know they can't outgrow that giant oak tree. They're going to try because if they can't, they'll die. The opposite reaction happens in all plants, in all animals, in everything. And that's the reaction that uses sugar is uh, respiration. So if we take our, our sugar and we add oxygen, so the oxygen that's from the air, we can create the other side, with CO2, which is what you're breathing out right now, um, water and energy. So we're taking this chemical bond, this sugar that has energy stored up in it from the sun, from the plants that made that energy, and we're using that to make energy, to move, to eat, to live, to airify greens. So. That's how we use food. It's how plants use food. It becomes important in plants because you would think, oh, well, they're making sugar. Um, they don't need oxygen. They're making oxygen. They don't need oxygen to do respiration. Well, it turns out in the roots, sometimes they do. Oxygen can be limiting. There's, there's few ways for plants to move oxygen throughout the entire plant. So sometimes there can be plenty of oxygen in the leaves of a turf grass plant, but the roots don't have enough oxygen to grow, and we can have root die back in the summer. And we'll talk about that quite a bit uh, later as we move forward in the course. So a simpler diagram to talk about photosynthesis and respiration. Uh, CO2 plus water plus light energy and chlorophyll, this happens in the plants, uh, makes our sugar and oxygen. To move it back, we take the sugar, we respire, which forms the other side. So lots of photosynthesis and lots and lots and lots of respiration going on in the soil and there's competition for the oxygen the oxygen can become the limiting factor in the soil for respiration hope that gives you a little bit of better understanding of chemistry if you have problems with this please find yourself an old chemistry book or a chemistry book in the library we've got a nice dr. Stacy has a nice collection of chemistry books 
or come see me and we'll try to get you up to speed with chemistry so you can understand the soil and the dynamics of life going on in the soil. Hopefully your plants uh, look good like this. Uh, nice uh, sample of Poanya here. And, um, and remember that even in the, the darkest depths of winter, chemistry is happening in the, in the soil.